to probe this area even after Fort Fisher fell. Uh, there's a little bit about the Federal Navy were in Myrtle Sound just to our north on January 19th seeing what was going on. There was a skirmish on February 17th near Smithville, not far from here on the other side of the river. Fort Anderson held on for a month. And as I said before, Fort Fisher is really cool, but most of Fort Anderson is still there. It is part of the uh, Department of Cultural Resources. It is a state historic site. If you've never been there, let me encourage you to go across the river and to see those works from that earthen fort as well. Fort Fisher hangs on for a month. There is actually a defensive line there at uh, Fort Fisher. There is another defensive line over here on this side below Wilmington. Uh, they hang on for a month until the Union forces get organized and uh, Fort, Th Fort Anderson is attacked on February 17th and falls on February 19th. Uh, the Confederate soldiers in that area evacuate. The Confederate soldiers on this side of the river also evacuate. Uh, there are skirmishes along Town Creek, Eagle Island, Smith's Creek, Northeast Ferry, and Fort Strong. With our defensive forces gone, Wilmington also falls just a couple of days later. It is captured on February 22nd of 1865. At that point in time, Braxton Bragg takes his Confederate soldiers and he starts marching toward the west from where we are now. On February 25th, General Joseph E. Johnston assumes command. He had originally commanded uh, the Army forces in Virginia, had been wounded during the Battle of Seven Pines in 1862. When he it gets better when he heals up. He takes command of the Army of Tennessee. I'm giving you a very abbreviated version of his history. The Army of Tennessee and fights against Sherman over in Georgia. And then he has a falling out, more than one, with Jefferson Davis. And uh, he is relieved of command. And he goes several places, but he eventually winds up in Lincolnton over kind of not far from where I live in western North Carolina. And Davis is, or um, Joe Johnston is in Lincolnton when he is picked by Robert E. Lee to take command of the remnants of the Army of Tennessee once again. The Army of Tennessee had been fought out at the Battle of Franklin and Spring Hill uh, over in Tennessee in late 1864. So Joe Johnston comes in. He originally makes his headquarters in Charlotte, North Carolina. He has the remnants of the Army of Tennessee. He has Confederate soldiers from the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, and he eventually gets all of the soldiers that are left in the Department of North Carolina as well, and they constitute his army. And he decides to consolidate his men over near where we now know as um, Bentonville. And he orders the troops from this area, from, from Bragg's command in that direction, and he takes his troops in and around Charlotte and Salisbury and Waxhaw and orders those troops as well to converge over in Smithfield uh, in uh, the Bentonville area. And as I said before, we're going to move over the entire state here uh, for the next few minutes. We're going to leave this area because once the federal forces capture Wilmington, the war is not over, but it is for the people here. There is a new occupying force, and it's time for the war to go elsewhere. On March 6th of 1865, federal forces leave New Bern and start moving toward Kinston and Goldsboro. On March 8th, the Battle of Kinston, or as also known as the Battle of Wise Fork, uh, begins, and it lasts two days until March 10th. This battle was intended to be a major move against that federal force coming out of New Bern, but it never worked out that way. Confederate numbers were insufficient to actually stop the Federals. That is a common story throughout much of the war, but especially in the last few months of it. On March 12th, the CSS Noose shelled Federal forces as they entered Kinston, and then the sailors aboard set the noose on fire and scuttled her there in the river, which is also another great if you go to Kinston, another great uh, Department of Cultural Resources, State Historic Site over there, you can visit uh, the remnants of the CSS noose as well. That same day that the noose is scuttled, the Confederate forces evacuate Kinston and move back over toward the Bentonville area. In March, 
the war comes to the Sand Hills region of our great state. Beginning on February 7th, the Federal Army under the command of William T. Sherman leaves South Carolina and starts moving into the Tar Hill State. There are skirmishes in Rockingham and along Southwest Creek that day. On March 10th, Confederate and Federal Cavalry forces clash at Monroe's crossroads. And on March 11th, Federals occupy Fayetteville itself. There are a lot of stories. Fayetteville, if, if you go over there and, and check out some of their resources, uh, there was a book that the United Daughters of the Confederacy did a hundred years ago about some of the things that took place in Fayetteville at that time. And if you know me and if you followed any of my writings or my blog post, you know I'm really, really interested in researching what happened here. Well, here doesn't matter as far as a place. Here matters wherever I happen to be. Fayetteville has this collection of stories about these Union soldiers coming in. Uh, did they burn Fayetteville like they burned Columbia or Atlanta, Georgia or those places? No. But there are stories that these ladies collected about soldiers taking pianos out of homes that had played songs like Dixie and Bonnie Blue Flag and burning those pianos. Of course... Federal soldiers destroyed the arsenal that was in Fayetteville. They knocked down all of the walls. Some of the machinery had already been shipped out uh, to Chatham County and other places. Machinery that had, part of it had come out of Harper's Ferry and was used to manufacture rifles during the war. They had gotten some of that equipment out, but they knocked down all of the walls of the arsenal and they destroyed that facility. They burned anything they could find connected to the Confederate war effort. Depots. They destroyed train stations. They destroyed rolling stock and trains themselves. They ripped up the lines. You might have seen some of those famous pictures of some of the bow ties the federal soldiers made of taking those rails out of, uh, off of the beds of the trains, off the beds, uh, and uh, heating them up in a fire and wrapping them around a post so they could not be used by the Confederate forces anymore. The federal soldiers stay in Fayetteville for a couple of days. Uh, and then they begin leaving on March 15th and they fight skirmishes at South Mill and at uh, South River. Confederate forces fought a delaying action at Averysboro on March 16th. I know they are planning a reenactment as well over there at that battlefield. They were trying to give the Confederates at Averysboro were trying to give federal forces more time or Confederate forces more time to pull their troops together. On March 19th of 1865, Joe Johnston launched a series of attacks on one of the wings of Sherman's army. His thought was maybe if we could destroy this one wing, we can push these Federals back or we can stop or we can give Robert E. Lee time to join us or we can give ourselves time to get up there and attack Grant's army, Meade's army outside of Petersburg in the rear. The Confederate forces are initially successful on March 19th. They do push back several lines of Federal soldiers, but in the end, the Federals are able to bring up reinforcements and the Confederate forces are forced to retreat. In two months, uh, we will, many of us will be back at Bentonville. Once again, it is a fantastic state historic site. They will be having a reenactment there. Uh, and I look forward to seeing some of y'all there uh, in about two months. Confederate forces are forced to retreat and they start moving back toward the Raleigh area. Sherman's army is able to consolidate not only his forces but also the forces under uh, Schofield and others coming up from Goldsboro and when they do those three different federal forces unite at Goldsboro they create an army of, of 90,000 men. That's a lot of Federals to be battling when you only have 20,000 Confederates in the state that you can put together in an army. In the western part of North Carolina, where I call home, a Federal Cavalry force under General George Stoneman entered the state on March 27th and began working his way from the western part of the state. He goes through Watauga County, he goes through Wilkes and Caldwell, and eventually turns north and goes up into Virginia. Uh, a few days later, on April 9th, he comes back uh, into North Carolina, works his way down to Salisbury, fights a good battle at Salisbury and wins. A portion of his troops fight another battle just outside of Salisbury at a bridge over the Yatkin River and loses. 
Stoneman then takes his men and he turns around and he heads back toward the west, passing through Alexander County, Taylorsville, through Lenore. Stoneman himself leaves the main part of the army uh, at Lenore and he takes his, his 1,000 Confederate prisoners and moves back uh, into Watauga County in Tennessee. But Stoneman's forces continue to move on. Uh, from Lenore, they go to Marion and to Morganton. And finally, on um, April, the latter part of April, Stoneman's forces sack Asheville itself. Which kind of is a sad story the way that it, it's come down in history. Asheville had already surrendered and the federal forces had moved through. And as the story goes, they had learned about Lincoln's assassination. And then they turn around and go back and sack Asheville. Rob, steal, plunder, etc., etc., contraband. Uh, Stoneman's forces, part of his forces, eventually um, stay in this area and part of them move on and go on. Upon learning of Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th, Jefferson Davis and members of his cabinet evacuate Danville, Virginia. They had left Richmond on April 2nd. And they had spent a week in Danville, and then when on learning of Robert E. Lee's surrender, they leave Danville and they go to Greensboro, North Carolina. They're in Greensboro for about five days. And there are so many refugees and so many sick and wounded from the Battle of Bentonville that the Confederate cabinet cannot find a place to stay. They are forced to sleep in a boxcar on a railroad siding. Jefferson Davis stays at the rented apartment of one of the staff members, but then he too goes back and stays at that boxcar on a passenger car on a railroad siding. It is in Greensboro, North Carolina that Jefferson Davis meets with Joseph E. Johnston and Jefferson Davis agrees to try and open negotiations between Johnston and William T. Sherman's army. Davis hangs around for a couple of days after giving that okay and instead of being able to take the railroad, which played so prominent in the central portion of the state's history in that time period, uh, the railroad has been wiped out by Stoneman's members. Davis and his cabinet either mount horses or ride around in ambulances and they go from Greensboro, North Carolina to Charlotte. It's in Charlotte that Davis learns of Lincoln's assassination. As one of the stories go, Davis was standing on the homes of the, on the steps of the home of uh, a man by the name of Bates, and he is giving a speech, trying to inspire his troops when a man walks up with a document that tells Davis of Lincoln's assassination. And Lincoln unfolds it, and he reads it quietly to himself, and the crowd is clamoring, wanting to know what the note says, and he passes it man to the man next to him, a man by the name of William Johnston, and Johnston reads it aloud to the crowd. This is just one story. If you're in a job like mine, you collect a lot of stories. There are stories about how Davis knew what was going to happen, that he authorized it. The federal government tried to prove that after the war, and they were never able to do that. Johnston spent, or Davis, Jefferson Davis spends a week in Charlotte. And it's in Charlotte, the entire Confederate cabinet meets for the last time. And it is in Charlotte that um, Davis authorizes his own surrender. And you can say, what are you talking about? The original terms worked out between Joseph E. Johnston and uh, William T. Sherman at the Bennett Place, another great state historic site. This is like the state historic site tour. Um, another great place that are planning some great events in April of next year. They work out this original set of surrender terms in which the civil officials are allowed to surrender. I'm giving you the very short version of the story. And Jefferson Davis, on April 24th of uh, 1865, agrees to those documents. He says, yes, I'm okay with this. As we now know, the copy of those documents that Sherman had that he sent to Washington, D.C., were rejected. Sherman comes back and he tells Johnston that. Davis wants Joseph E. Johnston to mount whatever men he can on horses and to rejoin him as Davis makes his way to the Trans-Mississippi Department to raise a new army to continue the war. Well, I told you earlier, Jefferson Davis and uh, Joseph E. Johnston don't quite get along. They've had a falling out earlier in the war. 
And Davis does, or Joseph E. Johnston does not do that. He surrenders his entire force there at the Bennett Place. It is the largest surrender of Confederate soldiers uh, during the war. How many men did he surrender? 89,270 Confederate soldiers. Were they all with his army? No. Had they been, then the Battle of Bentonville might have been a different story. But they were spread out all over the southeast, in North Carolina, in South Carolina, in Georgia, in Florida, in other places. Not having any more organized Confederate soldiers in North Carolina, Jefferson Davis decides that North Carolina is not a good place to be. So on April 26th of 1865, they hold that final meeting, the Confederate cabinet in the Pfeiffer home, and that afternoon, Jefferson Davis gets on his horse and he rides off in, eventually into South Carolina. He travels, and as he travels along, he loses staff members. George Davis, his attorney general, actually surrenders in um, North Carolina, uh, or, or resigns in North Carolina. Secretary Trenholm, who was Secretary of the Treasury, he resigned shortly thereafter. Even Judah Benjamin leaves him. By the time Jefferson Davis is captured on May 10th of 1865, only one of his cabinet members remained. Uh, it was his uh, postmaster, uh, John Reagan. So, in my opinion, on that afternoon, the Confederate government dissolves on April 26th of 1865 in Charlotte. You would think with the surrender of all of those Confederate soldiers at the Bennett Place that the war in North Carolina ended. That is not actually true. Uh, we historians like to pick April of 1865 when Lee surrenders at Appomattox and Joe Johnston surrenders at the Bennett Place as being a great place for the war to end. Well, it goes on for months and all of these small guerrilla actions taking place all over our state, both in the west where I live and here in the east as well. A raid was launched from East Tennessee into Haywood County in early 1865 by federal soldiers. Waynesville was occupied on May 6th, and there was a skirmish that took place there. In 1923, a marker was erected on that spot marking the, the area, quote, where the last shot of the war between the states occurred. There's probably some place, somewhere around 100 skirmishes that took place in those little over 100 days between April or between January, uh, the 1st of January and May 6th of 1865. And we do not actually have numbers about all of the men that were lost, but if we just look at the major battles, Fort Fisher, Fort Anderson, uh, Averysboro, the Battle of Bentonville, those Battles alone produced 5,771 federal casualties and 3,387 Confederate casualties. Just those four months here in the state of North Carolina. The war goes on, as I said a minute ago. There are, are little skirmishes all over the place in the, in the, the months and, and weeks after the surrenders take place. Go home and look up places like Fort Hamby over in Wilkes County. All of these groups of, of deserters and outliers running around. Um, really interesting part of our history is to continue that struggle, that study of that struggle that goes on in that time period. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. If you've heard me talk before, you know I'm interested in talking about what you want to talk about, which is a scary thing. I one time got introduced as the person who knows everything about North Carolina and the Civil War. And I don't even come close. But do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, first Fort Fisher, the Confederates came up when Butler was uh, unloading. They did fight. It was Kirkland's two uh, stripped down regiments. Could you describe that? Because they had to break up into small groups and they fought basically a... Uh, small company type action, I think. It's interesting how we start the war like that and we revert to that at the very end of the war, having to break up into small groups. Repeat the question. He's interested in the, the question was about the first attack at here at Fort Fisher and why we were sm fighting in smaller group actions. Um, you ever been to a big reenactment before? 
No. Uh, about 15 years ago, I was at the uh, anniversary of the Battle of Antietam. And the batal or the regiment that I was reenacting in at that time had about 800 men in it. Do you know how hard that was to maneuver that amount of men across that field with a bunch of people who don't do it all the time anyway? It is much easier to take those small groups of men and move them across the field and fight uh, than it is to take a larger organization um, and get it to where you're trying to go. Um, you have natural obstacles here, you know, on the island um, or here on the peninsula that we're on now. Uh, so, it, it, obviously, the commander at that point in time uh, thought that it was easier to send these small group actions. And occasionally, the company or battalion commanders themselves decide, hey, let's go over there and attack that without waiting for orders. So, did, did the 70 Union? Battleships have anything to do with it because the cannon would uh, fall into the sand harmless if they were in groups. They would be it's entirely possible uh, to go into the museum and look at the size of the shells that they were dropping here on the island. Um, entirely possible. In the front. Uh, did Sherman treat North Carolina any better than he treated South Carolina? He said he did. <laughs> well, no, he did. Uh, he said, uh, oh, repeat the question. Thank you. Did Sherman treat North Carolinians any better than he did the other folks that, who states that they marched through? Uh, yes. You know, if he, he actually had orders that said that we're not going to, to burn and plunder like we did in South Carolina. Why? Because South Carolina was the cradle of secession. Uh, so, yes, he did treat North Carolina, North Carolinians different. He didn't burn any towns here, even though he did destroy things and his men did rob and steal and subsist off of the countryside, not to the degree that he did in South Carolina. Probably only because South Carolina That's the thought. Yes, sir. I'm from Goldsboro, so tell us a little more about what happened in and around Goldsboro. Sure. There is more than one attack in Goldsboro during the war, or more than one raid. Uh, as the Confederate forces, um, they, they retreat in different areas and different places. Um, and, and Goldsboro is on the rail line, it had served as an important part during the war of that eastern coast rail line. Um, but as the, the federal forces are coming, the Confederates realize that there are so many of them that they cannot hold. And the Confederate forces retreat out of Goldsboro. This is late in the war. Retreat out of Goldsboro and fall back and join that main army and to fight. Uh, one of the big things for those folks that follow me around online, I believe that every town or county or community uh, big place or anything needs its own history about what happened there during the war. Um, Goldsboro is a good example. Uh, while we've got some fantastic books on Fort Fisher, we need a book about Wilmington and the war. Uh, and is there a book about Wilmington and the war that I've just missed someplace? I'm sorry? But it's more on the fort than it is on the town. We'll talk more about it later, Clint. Uh, but places like Raleigh, Goldsboro, uh, the Burlington area, Asheville, up until I wrote it two or three years ago, there was no book on Charlotte in the war. We need to continue to dig and research this information out for the general public. 